to actually see it. <laughs> Yo. I like how the show starts with Star Wars and uh, no spoilers. No spoilers here. No spoilers, please. <laughs> Folks, if you are catching our live stream after the show, we're going to go ahead and have some uh, show notes posted in the comments or in the descriptions below that you can go ahead and track down and jump to the topic that you are interested in checking out. So again, if you're catching the show after the stream, please make sure to check the description and comment section below. You know, Danny, and right now, we're, yeah, what's up? Sorry, finish up, finish up, finish up. I'm good already. That was, that was pretty much it on my end. I was just going to say, I, I think we should have a <laughs> show on your channel from now on, just because every time it's on my channel, like after the fact, everyone would just thumbs thumbs down my video and would say like, guys, we're wasting our time and just get to the point. It's like they don't understand it was like a pre-recorded live show. <laughs> Chase, what the heck? Just <laughs> your channel is all much better than mine, like after the fact. Right? I think it's your clickbait titles, man. Just tell them what it is. Just tell them what it is. Just let them know what they're getting themselves into from the it's beginning. Clickbait. It was literally exactly what we were talking about. A seven R three, A seven R two, Monday live. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's it's. It, it's in it, it's in the title, <laughs> and I, I did the precursor like you just did, telling people, "Hey, if you're watching after the show. Uh, be sure to uh, look yeah. at the time code or description box for the actual time code to the topic." And I, I think I think people just miss that. They just they just skip around, just be like, "Ah, oh, this is a waste of my time." Maybe they figure like the beginning. People need to chill out. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I think people are more understanding on on Danny's channel. Ooh, I'm the Brown saying in the chat, I might be mad at you over the A9 versus the A7R3. Oh, oh no. <laughs> What's going on? I'm the Brown. What is going on? Simon That's says, interesting. Uh, I wonder why he's upset. <laughs> what did you say, Dan? What did you say? I don't know what I've said. I've said a lot of things already at this point. You're there. You're still rustling people's feathers, huh? Oh, I hope I hope not. <laughs> that happened in the summer. I was done with that. Um, I was thinking. Uh, I was thinking David should pick up a, an A seven R three for rent and try it out in the summer heat and see how how it handles out there. It's a hundred degrees uh, wherever David is at right yeah, now. It'd be, be interesting. <laughs> you know well, what though? I've never had Sony cameras overheat, so I've been lucky. Um, it just hasn't happened. It's always been on my mind, though. That's one of the reasons I got the GH5 because of that exact reason. If you if you're in the sun, leaving it going, I, and remember, I'm I'm running off doing other things, and I I want to leave that camera just sort of shooting like the ceremony. It was always on the back of my mind. If gee, if it did stop, I'd be in trouble. So it was always on my mind, but it, it hasn't actually happened to me, luckily. So what you're saying is, Danny's a liar. <laughs> Oh, Danny just a Danny just, no, just a liar. <laughs> no, well, okay, Danny's not a liar. I, I I had the sixty five hundred and the A seven R two overheated on me, so it's very it's very believable that the A nine has overheated for Danny. So as far as your A nine usage, the same version's tougher. <laughs> have you have you have you been fine with the A nine then when when you were shooting out, David? So far, haven't used it this yeah. long. Yeah. Yeah, I've not, I haven't had the A9 over. I've never even had the logo actually coming up. I did a wedding uh, a week or so ago that was around 100 plus, and, yeah, there was no overheating issues at all with that. But but the way I got around it too with the Sony, I'd never record in 4K um, if I was shooting video because of that exact feature. I was worried about it overheating. If I, I bet if I shot in 4K, it probably would have. But, see, the GH5, I'll just leave going... 4K, it can even do 4K 60p, and it just doesn't ever even break a sweat out. So it, that's another thing, I suppose, that made me convinced to go down that avenue. Uh, look, I still love Sony way more than that, but it's just those sort of features worried me a little bit, doing everything on my own. I had to have something that wouldn't let me down, and, you know, I saw what you had with the with the Sony, the issues like that, and I hear people having <laughs> issues with it. But it's clearly a problem, um, yeah. but I around that by shooting 1080p and it never overheated for me mm. um you know it was always on the back of my mind if, if i it could happen all right so i'm the brown i mean with the a9 versus the a7 or three um 
I would say that the A7R3 is is a really good camera uh, for what it can do, both photos, video quality, and everything in that regards. And the A9, I felt that if you still wanted superiority over in sports, the A9 was still the way to go um, over the A7R3. But it's not for what I would do personally. The A7R3 would be more than enough. The A9 would just be kind of like the cherry on top if you really wanted the absolute best when it came to sports. But other than that, what as far as the A7R3, I still found it to be a very good camera. Uh, it just depends on what you're shooting and what you're doing with it. I love mine. I mean, it's perfect for events, I think. So I think it's for, for what, $1,300 less? Still a pretty good event camera, but obviously if you guys need the sports and the, and the wildlife stuff, the A9 might be better. Yeah, the A9 for peak sports and potentially wildlife, That's, I think that's where it's going to be at. Um, I had done the firmware update. Jason, have you done that firmware update? And <laughs> I, I forgot done. about it. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do my firmware update soon. Again, folks, those of you that are in the stream right now, we're still in pre-shit mode. We'll get started in about eight to nine minutes or so and uh, get started. And if you notice, we have another, uh, our guest this evening or this afternoon here for David Osler. We have him on board with us today. <laughs> David Osler. Can I, everyone? <laughs> Always joining in on our live chats. And now he's on the screen. Woo, I'm the brown. <laughs> Thanks, I Brown. Really appreciate it. Super I thought I'm the right. coming to I'm, Yep. Let's see here. Let's see if there was any other questions dropping in. You know, there's a there's a live chat highlights now and a live chat option. So like the highlights will show some messages and uh, and, and excludes possible spams while there's an option to just look at all the messages. Have you seen this? I I just see it now since you pointed it out. Yeah, it's new. I, I feel like it's a new feature. <laughs> David is a photo negative. <laughs> That's what Tony always keeps saying. We have a, uh, a growing sort of comedy between the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Ips asking, will you pick this pick up a uh, pick the Sigma 16 millimeter f1.4 for the a7r3 for both photo and video work? Jason, you have that lens and you have that camera. What would what would you do, Jason? Haunts would you use it for photos? Six, Sigma 16 millimeter haunts me. Everyone wants a review. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I definitely. I mean, like I, from the time that I've been playing with it, it's just, it's, it's a really good lens. It's, it's a fantastic lens for both photos and video. So yeah, definitely. I'm going to keep that did, lens did we, around. Did we solve if it, if it actually covered the full frame image circle or was there a strong vignette and was it cropped quite significantly? Well, Do we know that? We'll, we'll go find out right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Alan Hip, he's looking for an answer for you. Scott's Reviews asking, should I sell all my gear for the RX-10 Mark IV? What gear are you selling? That's what I would be wondering. And are you just looking for a casual camera that can kind of do everything? Like a jack of all trades, but not necessarily a master at one thing? So I think that's what that camera is. It's really good with a lot, with a lot of things. Yeah, it'd be a good travel camera because it's got great range. Uh, I certainly wouldn't replace, you know, an A6300 or A6500 with it, though. It's just something I wouldn't mind to travel with. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice, nice, um, there's a specific name for them, I forget, uh, bridge camera. That's what they would usually call those, yeah. bridge cameras. Yeah. <laughs> Jason's still doing Jason, his you There you go. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, if, I don't know if I can just show it on the screen. Is it even possible? Okay, okay. Sorry, so that's what say something. Yeah, looks like, right? Take a picture. Ugh. Just take Ugh. a picture <laughs> and show us. That doesn't look too bad. Um, with, uh, bad. with the one, vignette, you can, you it's, can it's bad. It's bad. But. One point three, one point two. Well, actually, wow, the clear image zoom is so different on the um, A7R three. 
you can go up to 1.5 times, but there's also like little increments in between that it doesn't really show you. It's very interesting. Hmm. All right, we'll, we'll wait on Jason's video on that very, very soon, and uh, he'll let us know all those answers and, and everything we need to know about the 16 millimeter F1.4. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I I'm probably gonna go ahead and and, uh, and rent out the 16 millimeter soon. So I'll, I'll probably put in a request for it soon. Um, let's see here. Damon Hart asks, "What's the best first Sony full frame lens? <laughs> what would be a good first full frame lens, David? What do you think would be a good first full frame Sony I, lens? If if depending on money, I I would personally." Go with the 35 f 2.8. Uh, if you haven't got any other full frame lenses, that that's my favourite focal length. I love that 35 mil uh, focal length. Plus, it's such it's so small, um, great for travel, and it's just that beautiful focal length for doing street photography and, and other things. I shot with it was the 35 1.4 actually on the weekend. I just put a video about that up, but um, I, I love that focal length. I just love what it offers. I know it can be sort of fairly wide, but I still find for portraits it's great. It, you know, there's not too much distortion with it, and that 35 2.8 is is really sharp. I, I love that lens actually. I use it a lot. I'm using the 24 1.8 on the Sony. 6, a6500 here and that gives you the 35 focal length equivalent as well so i always seem to be drawn to that 35 focal length as my favorite length that and the 85 uh, 1.8 probably the sony is a good purchase because uh, that's tack sharp and it's it's cheap um i'd probably go that way actually yeah D david and i are twinning right now a6500 with a 24 1.8 shooting us for this live show that's crazy <laughs> that is crazy um Focal length. Uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a fantastic focal wow. length for sure. Um, I don't know. For me, I'd choose the size fifty five for the full frame. Incredibly sharp lens. You can pick one up for like six hundred bucks on on eBay, great market too. So, not a bad price for fifty five. Yeah, that one's a really good, a really good. It's focusing uh, Sony lens as well. If you if you're talking about low light, I always use that if I'm struggling with low light because that focuses so fast in low light scenarios. So that's a great lens as well, and I do always carry that with me for weddings, particularly receptions and stuff. It, it's great in low light. Oh yeah, I love it. All right, uh, we'll probably take one more quick question here and then jump into the show. Zanke House HD saying, asking, I'm starting out and want to do portraits and events. My question is, should I get me a used APS-C Canon camera or go straight to a 6D used as well and build from there? In other words, which route to go, APS-C Canon or full frame? I get Same. Canon. What's that, David? I said, don't get Canon. Buy Sony. <laughs> I would not be buying Canon. There's no way. I'm going to be honest with people. I always say I'm never going to lie to anyone. Uh, there's no way I'd ever go back to shooting Canon or Nikon. Now I was a big Nikon shooter. That's all I had. And, you know, when I recently borrowed that Canon 5D Mark IV, because I, I actually uh, did a review for Profoto, the A1, um, the flash and I used the Canon for that and I hated it. I just hated the fact that you know, there was no EVF anymore um, It was a big clunky camera. I, I just couldn't stand it and it made me realize how much of an advantage it is shooting mirrorless just, Honestly, don't do it <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do it I'm going to I'm going to disagree with David. I'm going to disagree with David if you are on a really 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 tight budget and you can't pull the money for for the Sony stuff at this time, I think you can get by with with some Canon and some third party glass if you're really really on that budget in the meantime. But uh but yeah, I would if you can later going Sony might be a good way going mirrorless. Perfect. Jason, what do you say? Uh, let me take off this hat really quickly. Uh, if you're if you're very happy with the, uh, I mean, like, sorry, not if you're set on the Canon, get the sixty. Anyways, what are we talking about? There we go. <laughs> 
Well, folks, that's going to start our show this evening. It's 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's our Monday live show with Jason Bong and I, and we have a guest host this evening or this afternoon, wherever you're watching this from, and it's the one and only David Osler. Can you give us a, a little hi there for us? G'day, guys, uh, from Down Under in this lovely warm day today. It's great to see you all. All right. Awesome. And so we we have a, quite a few news topics we're going to be taking a look at today. So I'm going to run through them very quickly. There will be show notes if you're watching this in the future. Um, we're going to briefly mention LensRental.com's little deal going on. It's not sponsored, unfortunately, but they have a little deal going on. We'll mention a little bit about Sigma's first FE lenses, uh, the update to Adobe Lightroom, this universal lens cap uh, that you might be interested in. We'll pick also, David Osler's brains on the GH5S and what his interests are in that, the iMac Pro, and sadly some news on a famous photographer, Chinese rooftopper, who fell to his death. And uh, we'll look into those topics this evening. But before we get into that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our usual hashtag new gear segment and um, go ahead and let us know what new gear you've just recently picked up. And we're going to go ahead and start with Jason Vong. Are our um, gas entre what was it extraordinaire? What have you recently picked up, Jason? I like how you set that up, but I actually didn't get anything new. <laughs> 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 I like how you set that up. I was like, our gas extraordinaire. What did you pick up this week? <laughs> uh, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, I didn't really pick up anything other than um, Aki did send me like a few power strips for my new office space. So I uh, just got to set those up. And um, also got my Sennheiser AVX uh, lavalier microphone back. So for those of for those of you guys who have been following me, um, I've been having a little bit of audio issue with my previous AVX. I was just getting some weird sort of spike in my audio level. You can hear it a little bit distort whenever I, I start talking really loudly, which really sucks. So I had I had to send it back to to get it checked out. But I think um, they just sent me like a new set, so I just need to test that out and hopefully it works. Yeah, it's it's kind of felt like it's been a while since you you sent that away. So, how long yeah. did it feel? Like a month, uh, month and a half? almost like three three to four weeks. Um, okay. I honestly what didn't wasn't in a rush to get it back. So when I sent it, I think I sent it almost like the week of Thanksgiving. So it was just a bad companies because you know when whenever you send things right before the holidays things tend to get lost messages tend to get lost so i think that's that's literally what happened so i had to give them a call two weeks after to follow up and then a week later they, they shipped it back to me all right and you have have you had a chance to test it out yet no not yet not yet so when i shoot my youtube video that's when i'll test it out with the Sigma 16 millimeter review, of, of course. With, with the 16, yeah, of course. That's that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, how are you doing there? And uh, what have you recently picked up, if anything? Well, I've only there's only a couple of things that I've actually picked up. I I just bought a new drone because um, I crashed my other one, the Phantom Four. Um, so I actually bought some ND filters, but I noticed I've bought these ones, which I'm not sure if you guys have ever used these ones. These are the DJI, DJI filters, but they're basically, I bought them and I'm sorry I did because they're really tiny and they're very hard to get on and off the actual drone itself. Like, so I bought different ones. So I, I bought those for nothing. I thought, oh, here we go again. So I ended up buying these Polar Pro uh, ones which seem to be much better made. Um, they they actually sort of go over the whole uh, camera mount and then you can take them off easier. They they sort of fit securely. Those other ones from DJI were terrible. The second I bought them and tried them, I thought, oh, I shouldn't have bought these. I, I probably should have sent them back, but I just didn't do that. I'll keep them as spares. But I've just got the ND8, 16, and 32. Um, I don't think these are the polarizer ones. I, I thought I was buying the polarizing ones, but they're not. So again, I should have done more research when I bought them. Um, but overall, I'm really happy with how these look uh, and they feel really good quality. It seems to be great glass, easy to get on and off. Um, so I'm not sure how they'll go. I haven't used them yet in full-on filming though. Are these what you use, Jason, or what are you using for NDs? Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, I actually had the Polar Pro, and then I had I have Sandmark as well. They're both great, and it's just interesting what you showed me with the DJI. It just seems like it's it's pretty, it looks really flimsy. I mean, like the the only attachment are those three, yeah. those three prongs right there, right? Yeah, so like the Polar Pro and the Sandmark yeah. are very similar. You just it's like a cap. You just you just stick it on and it works. And I had no issues with them. So they're both really fantastic qualities and um, great. You just got the have other thing anything. too that was really was really interesting was they also come with this little um, well, it's a little card, but you can download an app which I found oh, wow. was fantastic because what it what it does is this is for DJI, but it's actually for these filters. So you put in your settings that the drone is is telling you like your shutter speed and everything else and then it will tell you which filter you actually have to apply onto the drone so it's a great thing if you're not quite sure uh what you wanted to use and that you can download that it's free uh, i didn't know anything about it until i bought these filters uh that and that was a card that came in it so it's another great thing but yeah i wouldn't recommend the dji ones don't get these ones they are really flimsy incredibly hard to get off you've almost got to pry them off and i was worried about damaging the actual gimbal um, That's so I definitely wouldn't go that way. Yeah. Wait, David, That's all I bought. I've been quiet. What drone were you, are you using now, you said? Because the other one you said crashed? I'm using the, yeah, I have, I've got a Phantom 4, which was uh, just the original white one, and I crashed that one. And um, it, it still works, but the actual glass on the gimbal has been broken. And I asked about getting it fixed, but they said it would cost more, basically, than just buying a new drone. So I went out and bought the new white uh, Phantom, uh, the um, is it the Phantom Pro or whatever it is? I bought that one to replace it, and I love that because it's so much easier now for me to pack that up and fold the arms out of the drone as compared to carrying around this massive backpack uh, when I'm shooting weddings. Because I'm starting to shoot a lot of, of weddings with that for video, uh, you know, to show aerial mm -hmm. views when I'm doing my wedding videos now. So it's so much better having that new drone than having the big Phantom. But I'll, I'll just keep the other Phantom as a play thing that I can just go stupid with it and not worry about it, you know, that if I crash it, I crash it and, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, I just can't. I wanted to try and buy NDs for it, but you can't buy NDs that um, clip on the, the old um, Phantom. It's Yeah, they screw off. But the problem oh, yeah. is it somehow became locked and when it crashed and I can't get that filter off now. I've tried everything, pliers, everything. It just doesn't come off. God, you're stuck with that ND for life now. Oh, man. That reminds me of my <laughs> yep. big lens that has a filter stuck on it and it won't come off. Okay, anyway. um, <laughs> gear, I, I picked up a uh, Canon MX922 922 printer. Um, why? I, I just need another printer to print some simple 4x6s and, and just print some things here and there, nothing serious. Um, and then I went ahead and purchased a bracket that will convert a palsy buff kind of light uh, modifier to Bowen's mount. So I bought one earlier, and it was like it didn't fit right. It didn't work, so I reordered I ordered another one to try it. So I'll go ahead and check it out and see if the mount works, and I can switch it off so I can use it on my uh, my Godox uh, 600s. So, yeah, that's what I read. Was that an A4 printer, that, that one? What's that, David? Is that an A4 printer or is it an A3 printer, the Canon? Uh, it'll print letter size, if that's what we're going for. Like the yeah, that's like A A4, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's going to do it for me at this time. And, um, yeah, not trying to make any major expenses at this time. So, all right. Our walls are still in the seven R three. All right, let's see here. Cool. If you see anything in new gear, let me uh, just go for it. All right. Uh, let's see here. I noticed. I noticed um, what's that, Dave? I noticed Scott up there is saying too. He was talking about earlier about should he sell his gear or whatever, and he's actually saying, "Okay, we'll keep my gear, and I'll add the seventy to two hundred f four for nine hundred dollars." And and I think that's a really good buy. I I love that seventy to two hundred f four. Um, it's one lens that I use all the time. Um, I haven't got the G Master, unlike you guys. I think both of you guys may have the G Master lens. I'm not sure, but I, I don't want to be lugging around that heavy glass anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I, I like the F4 versions. And you know what? I find that with the high ISO of these cameras nowadays, that 
the F4 is not really much of an issue for me anymore. And to be honest, I'm mostly starting to shoot um, the primes. I mean, I'm using more prime shooting than any uh, of my zoom lens sort of now. I tend to just basically shoot with the 35 and the 85, but I'll also use the 70 to 200 if I need that compression. So that's why it's a really good lens if you want to compress the background in. Uh, it, it's a great lens for that. And I'm finding the 70 to 200 is a really nice sharp lens. Uh, and it's nice and light too. It's got stabilization built in. Um, if you can't afford the G Master, it's certainly a, a good option. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a go to lens. Definitely. Um, if, for the people that can't get to that G Master. <laughs> All right. Um, Arnold Gallinato, new gear, iPhone 10, and the Sony 70 to 200 G Master. It looks like Arnold's going to be mounting the 7200G Master to his iPhone 10. Is that possible? Can you mount that? Is, that used to be possible. I think <laughs> Sony used to sell an adapter for you to mount your e-mount lenses to your iPhone, but they, they immediately took that off. So That'd be awesome. You can mount some of your G Master lenses to your phones. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I, I, they, they stopped selling that for some reason. I was actually interested in picking one up. <laughs> All right. I'm the Brown, new gear, Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4, and Star Wars Battlefront 2 for Xbox One. Oh, All right. Boy. You better pay Ooh. some milk for that Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah, <I'll see>. Whatever. <laughs> I think they got rid of that. Didn't they just completely get rid of the whole purchase system? Man, I, I, that point, there was I think that's controversy. Like, I was just, I was just hearing things. Uh, like bits and pieces, but I heard it was like crazy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bao Wen, new gear, Flash Point 8200 Flash Twin Head, X Pro C transmitter, and pre ordered the X Pro S transmitter and basic mag mod kit. Cool. Very nice. John Paul says uh, he subscribed to Adobe Law apps instead of just photography to be able to do some video editing. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, interesting, because um, I've moved away. I did start to do uh, Premiere, and I, I didn't like it that much. I actually completely swapped over to Final Cut, so I got rid of those other apps and went to just the photography um, Adobe apps, you know, just Lightroom and Photoshop. I might actually consider... Actually, no, I still need Premiere, though. Dang it. Ugh. <laughs> Listen, just, come back, just come back to Premiere. It's OK. There's nothing uh, no, wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm riding both trains right now, so it's just <sighs> really? That's it's just supporting Adobe. It's, it's, it's definitely expensive, though. I mean, but it's, that, but it's that just part of everything. Out. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um. Did you say that one? John Lee's New Gear knockoff Edicron? I, I have not yet. Or at least not me. Edicron Flex Z Tilt. What is that? Um, it's, it's this thing where you can, like, you know, kind of like pivot the camera, tilt the camera um, when, you're doing like, when you're doing like slider shots so you can get like different angles. Because I have the Edicron wing and that goes back and forth, that little tiny thing that can you go. Have that? You know, I have two. What? Hey, they let someone over. Yeah, I have I have two <laughs> Edicron wings because the first one I got had weird weird damage to it, but it still uh -huh. functioned. I let them know. I said, "Hey, you know, this thing's messed up." It, it, and I had it and I unboxed it. It was all messed up. And I asked them um to get another one, but they but they they said just hold up, just keep the other one. So now I have wow. two. They said replacement and I guess they didn't I'll, want them. I'll gladly take the broken one if you don't if you don't want it because I was actually interested in picking one up myself. Do you like it though? I haven't really seen you use it in YouTube videos. I, I don't I don't even use it much. I don't even use it much. I should just arbitrage it to Jason. All right, moving on. Arbitrage <laughs> it. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. John John Imperio says a new gear, 32 inch newer Octobox, and some fairy lights. Oh, those fairy lights, though. I haven't used them yet. Chris Cheek, new gear, A7R3. Damn. There you go, Chris <laughs> Cheek. Finally, <laughs> finally with us on board the A7R3 train. 
wow, he went to a thumbs down right away. What is that? <laughs> what is that? I don't know. <laughs> hey, speaking of which, did you did you ever got your discount, Danny, for your A7R3? Man, I didn't I didn't even get that whole thing set up, man. I haven't even got the whole thing set up. So <laughs> Diana Gladney, um, hashtag new gear, Panasonic ZS70 for vlogging and a peach cobbler fresh out of the oven from scratch. Whoa. <laughs> I, I, I am hungry. <laughs> Jason Vong, pop and locking. Did he want to be part of the job walking? <laughs> Someday. Someday. I know that Simon too said um, that give the Elder Chrome wing a miss. I haven't used that, but I do have a lot of Elder Chrome um, gear. I, I love their slider one. I've got that, and I think that's a fantastic slider. I've also got, I can't remember the name of them too. There's another one where I have it where it's got wheels and you can open the wheels and do, do sliding with that. Um, there's another contraption I use. I can't remember the name of all of them, but it's sort of, it's like a tripod mount that I use all the time as well. I find their stuff to be really well engineered um i mean i'm not sponsored by them or anything but i just find their stuff is good it's not cheap though um but it does seem to be really you know well made i notice there's chinese knockoffs but i do always like to try and buy the original stuff if i can rather than the the chinese knockoffs so i do sort of support elder crown i think they're a good company actually i didn't even i didn't even know they already had like third party things out there but i mean i haven't been in the market for for other yeah, things like that yet. There's been a few, but if I had if I had to choose, I I side with David. With I would just go for the Elder Chrome. It's crazy expensive though. We have the um the slider mini and the module itself was like four hundred US dollars. I was like, crap, man. I was like, why would you charge this much just for just for the module itself? It's it's insane, but uh, it works though. There you go. Um oh so Chris Cheek said the thumbs down was for a premiere. Ouch. Ouch, I use Premiere all the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was considering Final Cut. I was I saw an update for it. I, I guess you saw it too, right? The color. Yeah. I just want to be able to have a, a Lumetri. There's like the, the Premiere Pro has this Lumetri system where it's like Lightroom where you move the sliders around and do color grading. I'm just I just wish Final Cut had something that was just one to one of that. That was very, very similar. And they did update some new color grading tools in Final Cut, but unless David, David, do you know anything? Uh, do you know what I'm talking about though with the sliders and color grading? Yeah. yeah, it's very the the new update, the 10.4, I think, was their biggest update that they've actually done. It it's it's actually gone very similar to DaVinci, so it's very close to how DaVinci works. I used a um, color finesse. To, to get the color correction before because the color controls just weren't strong enough. But this new update, to be honest, since I've been using that, I haven't used Color Finesse anymore. It's, it's actually become incredibly powerful. You know, you can even go down to just controlling hues, uh, everything, you've got white balance control now built in. Uh, it, it's basically got everything. The big difference for me and why I changed from Premiere to Final Cut was because I'm shooting in 4K nearly all the time, Final Cut was really slow, and that that was the issue. Look, if you're shooting, if you've got PC, it's probably fine to be using Premiere, but I think if you're on a Mac, I can't recommend to use Premiere because it just doesn't work as well as what Final Cut actually renders. It, it's incredibly fast at bringing images in and playing 4K footage in real time without wasting any time at all. I don't need to use proxy files. I don't need to do any of that. Admittedly, I'm using a Mac Pro, but a new high-end iMac would would also be able to do it, but it it just works and it works very fast. So if you're on the Mac side, I'd definitely say use Final Cut. If you're on the PC side, I'd say well, obviously you would be using Premiere or DaVinci perhaps. But the new color upgrades are really powerful. You you probably should have a look at it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I'm still going to be using Premiere, but <laughs> but definitely will. It's just I use it at work, and then I'm using it. It's just we're, it's just, I think, it's I mean, just, I'd love, we're, we're so ahead, used to Jason. using, we're, we're so used to using Premiere, you know, we, we, you, I think you and I both, you know, started with PC and that's something that we've used for so long. It's just so, so hard to learn something else. So yeah. I, we're just so much quicker with Premiere, even though it takes a while to render out the proxies, it's just so much quicker. 
to like put things together. I was watching this like four hour video from Taryn who does the edits for Linus Tech Tips video. He uses Premiere Pro and he talked about all the scripts and things that he made to be able to edit much faster in Premiere. I was just blown away. And I, I, I learned more things from it. And so, but I, I like the flex, like for example, if I was just using a, a MacBook Pro, for example, I would definitely use Final Cut. If that was just, if I was just using a MacBook Pro, I, I would use Final Cut all the time, but. Send, send me the link. All right, I think we've, I'll, I'll, I'll watch. <laughs> It's really cool <laughs> stuff that I learned. I didn't even know it was possible. So anyway, we've been talking for that too long. Let's keep going down the line here. We're still in the hashtag new gear. I don't know. I think that was it. There was nothing else. Let's see. <laughs> okay. I think we're good. Awesome. Um, yeah. All right. Cool. We're going to go ahead and jump into the news topics now. We'll just kind of go through it, and you guys can chime in when you can, and we'll talk about it as we go through. So the first news item that I put on here it's not really supposed to be an ad where it's not sponsored or anything, but just something to, for those of you. I don't know if Lens Rental ships out. Is it, is it just the, in the U.S.? David, did you have your own rental yeah, service area? It's not the U.S. Well, we do have rental companies, but not Lens Rental yet. Hmm. So LensRental.com, I guess if you're in the U.S. and whatever areas they might be sending it to, they are at offering an extra week um, for the rental if you – if you're if you order something for rental and it arrives before December 22nd and it has a return date after January 1st works. So if you are planning to get something to try out, you can easily get about um, a week's worth of it and plus an extra week as well. I think the coupon code is extra week one where I should have asked them to be a sponsor. Damn it. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> so that that's that's it. And I think I'm gonna use that to rent out the Sigma 16 millimeter f1.4 and and work on a review for that over the little break uh, that I he's have. Gonna and, have uh, yeah, he's going to have his review out way before me. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be waiting for Jason's review as well to uh, make some general comparisons. So, yeah, hopefully. So if you could rent something, Jason or David, um, I know, you, uh, David, you don't have lens rental out there, but um, if there was something on your mind right now you just wanted to try out at this very moment, what would you like to go ahead and rent out if you could rent out anything from a rental store? Well, I personally like to, to rent out the 100 to 400. Um, I'd love to try that lens, even though, I, like I said, I don't use zooms much. I wouldn't mind to try that out for something for trying birding photography. That's uh, the feathered uh, variety, not the other variety. But um, I'd actually like to try that um, to give it a go just to see what that sort of focal length is like. Um, it, it sort of interests me to give that a go for, for doing stuff like if I was traveling or whatever and I wanted to grab some photos of, of birds and stuff like that. I'm also using it with the A9, you know, I'd just like to try how fast that can actually track. It, uh, it's amazing. It's basically was specially designed. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've said that. So that's why I'd like to try that lens. Uh, I'd also like to try it for doing some sports photography down here as well. We have a thing called uh, Australian Rules Football, which uh, I'd love to take that and see, you know, if I can get some of the high marks and stuff. Um, but, yeah, I think that's probably the thing that I would try rent before anything else is that 100 to 400 do you have that lens i i had it from pro support so uh, i don't know if you're on pro support david but i don't know if they're in pro support australia yes, I, am, yeah. I i usually what i do is i just shoot them an email and they'll let me know it's like hey we'll send it out to you and they send it to me yeah but yeah. through lens rental and then i usually get a week if you need an extension you can always ask and they'll, they'll give you a yes or no and, and you can usually extend your use of the lens so I checked it out. I absolutely love the 100 to 400. It is it is a fun lens to have. I, I'm if I do end up getting another zoom lens, I might consider the 100 to 400. It's just a really nice lens. Uh, and you know what? You're talking about high ISO performance. I was that's why I was blown away at 100 to 400, and even at 5.6 at low light conditions, the A7R3 and even the A9 did really well still at high ISO scenarios. And so I I was just it was it was a fun lens to have, so yeah, definitely definitely try that out. Yeah. Jason, what would you get? Well, you know, Jason Vong doesn't rent gear; he buys them. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, I mean, like I probably just rent the A nine just for comparison's sake with the A seven R three, but also probably a few of the um, the uh, Zeiss. Um, what you call it? The um, the one for APSCs. 
uh, I forgot. You don't, don't you own them all already? <laughs> I don't own all the Zeiss. I wish I had the money to own all the Zeiss. I mean, like just just for collection's sake, I, I I wouldn't mind just having it. But damn, they're so ex they're they're so expensive. But I'm interested in picking up a few of the the APS-C versions of the um, Zeiss lenses, the one that autofocuses. I forgot what it's called. It's not Darn the it. Tuit. It. There we the go. Tuit series. Yeah. It's the Tuit series. My, yeah, there we go. It's Is the it? Tuit so I, I want to say that right. Yeah. Yeah. Just to mess around with, play with, and see. I know they they do make a noise when they autofocus in video mode, which kind of sucks. But just for like image, just to see the image quality and and the sharpness and everything, I'm I'm just very curious about those lenses. Folks, those of you in the chat, if you could just go, if you were going to go and grab something from rental, what would you pick up? I'd like to know. Or um, it's just something you've been itching to want to try, whether it's Sony or a different brand or a camera. What would it be like if you had a choice? It could be anything you wanted from the rental store, but it had to be one item. What would you want to go ahead and pick up? And it can't be something that doesn't exist yet, like the A7S III, which is still in that truck that I took. But anyway, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Oh boy. <laughs> At 4K 60p, man, that's what it's going to have. 1,000 as well. That same truck's got the A6000 uh, 6, in it as well, the new A7000. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the 6700. That's the official official name. That's what it says on there. <laughs> Show name. All right. Um, we'll jump to what the chat's saying in a little bit, but the next thing we're going to take a look at is the fact that um, it's, this is coming from Sony Alpha Rumors, but Sigma is going to drop some FE lenses very soon. Not APS-C in, uh, in this case, but they do have a few out there. But they're going to be dropping their art series first through FE mount uh, for Sony. And the rumored release date time frame based on Sony Alpha Rumors. Sources say February 2018. Um, and so... I wanted to go ahead and ask not just you guys in the chat, but also Jason and David, if you had a Sigma art lens that you would like to see come out first for FE to try out, would you consider seeing first? Which one would you like to see first? Uh, I think for myself. Um, I used to. You go, Jason. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of lag in between us. But um, yeah, I, I sold my Zeiss 35 1.4. Super regret it. Uh, I want to pick it up. I want to pick it back up. But I think with I think the 35 1.4 from Sigma is coming out. One of the first ones to come out, right, Danny? So that might be the one that I would pick up next because I am missing a 35 1.4 right now. Yep. Damn it. That's what I was going to say, too. David, what would you get? <laughs> Well, I, I used to have quite a few Sigmas, the art series, actually, when I shot Nikon. I used to have the 85 1.4, and I also had the 35 1.4, which I sold when I went to Sony. They're actually amazing lenses. They're, they're, they're really good lenses. The, the thing is, I suppose, I'm not sure we need another 35 because there's, there's that many 35 mil lenses out there that I think it would have been better probably if they released a 135 or something like that. Uh, lens, but if, if you had to sort of talk about the difference between the the reason why I particularly love the Sony one so much is because of that de-clicked aperture that you can use, and that is the main difference for me with that Sony lens. That because I'm now shooting so much video, to have that de-click aperture on the Sony Zeiss lens, the 1.4 is amazing. So whether Sigma give mm -hmm. you that feature, I'd pay a thousand dollars extra just for that feature alone. That's such a massive thing for me to be able to change aperture without having that stepping going on. But I don't think we need another 35. But having said that, their lenses are really amazing quality. Like I said, I love the 85 1.4 that I had from, from Sigma. Um, I, I think I'd probably prefer them, like I said, if, if I'd love them to bring out a 135 or something like that. We're still waiting on Sony to release that. I know Jason bought the, um, the Zeiss one, which I think would be gorgeous as well because I love my Batis. I mean, I think that's... The 85 is stunning as well. There's something about that Zeiss pop, and they do say that, but I do find that it does give you that bit of a pop. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I probably would look at Sigma, but I've tried to stay native in everything that I've bought, and I've talked about that in my channel as well because, for me, it's important to be able to send stuff back to Sony Pro support. So that's probably one reason why... I wouldn't be buying a Sigma because if something fails for me being a professional photographer and my life depends on it for working, I need to be able to send that off to Sony and that then the Sony Pro support works so well. So 
you know, it's worth it in itself just to have that Sony Pro support. So I probably won't buy the Sigma stuff. <laughs> I, that's good. I, I really like that diverse opinion there, David. Really appreciate that. Um, I don't know. I've just been a stickler for the Sigma lenses. I still use them. Still this day, I use the MC11 adapter. Um, way drug to the Sony Sony lenses if you're trying to work your way up there and you can't budget at this time. Uh, I, I'd really like to see uh, them bring some other prime lenses out. I'm still waiting to see a Sigma 70 to 200 sports series lens. I'd love to see one of those come around later. But yeah. just so that there'd be more de more options for uh, the users out there uh, soon, so that way there's some more competition with with the glass. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the chat really quick and see uh, what it is that they wanted to rent. <laughs> let's see out here. Um, Dave Sincere is asking, can you rent strobes? I think so. I think it just depends, right? I think yes, just you depends. can rent Pro Photo. You'd be able to rent Pro Photo for sure. I've never tried, but I, I imagine it'd be possible. JPH Creative says rent the 85 millimeter f1.8. Arnold Gallinato, great line. <laughs> Arnold Gallinato, 100 to 400 G Master for sure. Gerald yeah. Williams, A9. I'll call Pro Services for a loaner. And it's are you okay, man? How's it going, Thank man? You. Hopefully, are you okay? <laughs> I saw we bumped into him. Um, done a how current lens camera collection the, video. The, the how do you find the Zeiss um, 135 2.8? Do you find that 2.8s ample, Jason, or, or would you wish for a 1.8? I think it's ample. To me, it's just it's fine. Like the, it, it gets off that blur. I mean, it's because of that compression as well. It's just one thing that I, I I would need to do is make a comparison between the 85 1.8 and the 135 2.8. To me, the results looking are looking very similar, but I really need to put it side by side to really see if there's any like huge difference. So that's what something I'm waiting for. But when I used it for like a wedding film, it looks great. It looks fantastic. I loved it. It was it's it's perfect. Yep. I want that, that 1.8. <laughs> <laughs> Book a monster. Okay. Uh, let's see. Andrew Jenkins rented the 10 to 18 to Disneyland. It's not a bad lens, he says, but it just sucks in low light. It can, oh, it yeah. can be, yes. I yeah, four. agree. Um, yeah, four. Rai Uemura says, damn it, I was going to request a 402.8 G Master, but <laughs> yes, they don't exist yet. It will, though. I mean, right? Yeah, it will. It's for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Done. Epic Red Dragon and some Prime Zeiss glass. Yes. Carol says the 16 to 35 millimeter F2.8. Oh, let's see. Let's see what else. Some folks are saying 135 F1.8, unless that was a different topic there. All right. Probably a different topic. Okay. That's for the Sigma topic. That's for the Sigma topic. Oh yeah, what lens did they wanted to see, right? Sigma 135. Wow, everyone's going for the 135. They just want to stick it to my face. <laughs> Ninja Inferno, he's actually said there. So Troy said he, he I've read the Atmos Ninja Inferno to see if my Sony A6300 can truly output 8 bit 422. Is that the one you had, Jason? I've got an Atmos, but it's the Shogun. Um, I have the uh, Flame, the Ninja Flame. Is the Inferno the newer one? Inferno is the newer one. I think it's basically the GH5, right? The, wait, no, that's the Ninja Inferno. Yeah, wait, which is it? Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't have an answer for that. <laughs> Socrates is telling me to get the Rocket on 35 1.4. I don't know. I heard I, I, I heard mixed opinions on the Rocket on series, so... It's See, I'm just, gonna rent, I'm, I'm just going to rent it. I was thinking about buying it. I'm just going to rent, rent it. Mark. I don't want to spend so much Danny, money. I'm just gonna, I'm just Danny gonna is the that is that one renter guy? The one renter. <laughs> guy. I really. What have you guys awesome. heard about the twenty four one hundred five as well? I mean, Alex is asking about that. Have, have any of you guys tried the twenty four one hundred five? Only uh, if, only at the uh, press event that I went to. Which oh, man, that lens is incredibly sharp. 
So well, it's, it's I sent back. One. I sent back my 100 to 400, so I'm going to put the 24105 as a pro support request, and we'll see how how long the line is for that. So, if I can get that's it a great focal length. It is. Yeah. It's Something I'll probably use more for video, actually. Yeah. BMB Films wants to get a rent out a C200. I don't use can anymore, but I'd love to try the C200. But yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to go jump back to the news topics really quick here and, and jump through it. Um, Adobe Lightroom, if you didn't catch already, happened earlier last week. Uh, they finally pushed out a support for RAW for the A7R3, so you don't have to worry about using Capture One if that's not your thing. But um, so I had so I was using Capture One for a couple of weeks prior, and then now I jump back to the Lightroom, and man, Lightroom is dog slow as usual, and uh, it, was just, it was just going so not surprised, right? Not surprised. But cat with the uh, what was it with Capture One? I was able to go through thousands of images through the sports that I was shooting. But it was it was it went through pretty quickly. It wasn't too bad. But when I jumped back to Lightroom, having like a thousand images in the catalog and going through them, it just was going so slow. So I jumped back to using Photo Mechanic to pick out my photos and then import that into mm -hmm. Lightroom, which was much faster. So I'm back yeah. to my old system. Yeah, that that whole import thing but, has yeah. always been so slow. But I think when you start editing the photos, like when when I load up the 42 megapixel photos just to start editing, it's so much quicker now on Lightroom. I think in that aspect, in that regards, Lightroom has gotten better and faster. But still, importing, loading up those previews has just been really slow. And what what I was really disappointed about is I, I also can't see the photos that I've rated on camera on the import window for Lightroom. So that was a huge bummer. And I think that's something that we talked about last week, Danny, that Lightroom was, was never capable of doing that as well. Only yeah. if you use photo mechanics or like Sony's software yeah. that you can actually see the rated photos before you actually import in. So that was one of the annoying thing that I found after afterwards. David, what's your go-to? Another advantage too with that. Well, I was going to say, actually, I use Lightroom, but um, there's another big advantage that they did in that update as well. They've added full editable curves for the first time. So you always used to have to, there was a curves, uh, dialer box in the old version of Lightroom, but you couldn't add points and really correct it that way. So they've they've really upped their game in curves. So and I use curves extensively for my photo editing. So it's given me one better feature that I can actually use now in in Lightroom. I found it definitely has sped up. It, it's still not fantastic, but it, it's definitely sped up the new version compared to the old version. So but I, I just find that cataloging cataloging is the thing that keeps me to that Adobe side. It just works so well, the cataloging. And like when, as Jason said, once you've built one-to-one -one previews, it's then reasonably fast to, to actually work. And I just basically import the images and then walk away and let it just build those one-to-one -one previews. It might take a couple of hours, but once it's done, it then is incredibly fast. But I just think there's nothing better. I've looked at the other programs that are out there, Capture One and, and stuff, and uh, it was probably like you with, with um, Premiere. I, I, I know Lightroom so well that I just don't yep. want to learn something new. And I, I've just found it is very powerful and it works so well with, with Photoshop, you know, so I'll, I'll be sticking with, with Lightroom for the CB of, you know, for the future. But it comes basically standard with Photoshop anyway, and there's no way I'm going to give Photoshop up. And that package includes Lightroom with it. So I'll, I'll just work with them together. Yep, absolutely agree. Yeah, I'm willing to deal with the slowness with Lightroom. It's just I'm just so used to it at this point. But I just use Photo Mechanic to cull through lots of images. But once, like you said, it was faster. Uh, Lightroom was noticeably faster. It's just the culling process is not something that you want to you want to do in Lightroom. <laughs> it just will take a long time. Yeah, so Danny, you do it through Photo Mechanics first, and then port it into Lightroom, right? Yes, I will cull through like uh, the photo mechanic and then start it. The, the the thumbnail previews generate the previews themselves generate much faster in photo mechanic. Mm -hmm. I just tag them and then import into Lightroom. It's it's a breeze. It's so much faster. All right, fantastic. Okay, moving on. We've got another thing going on here. It's uh, it's called the 
it's a universal lens cap. So I guess my question is, um, Jason or David, David's got a really interesting answer for us coming our way, but do you ever lose your lens caps or even the back lens, uh, the back caps on your lenses? Um, would you want to just have one lens cap that would work for all your lenses in your bag or in your case? I, I it sounds like an advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's something that I never really <laughs> thought about. I mean, like, it's just like, oh, I lose a lens cap, just buy a new one. I never really thought like, oh, I need one that fits them all. I, I've never actually thought about that. So that is, it's definitely strange in my books at least. So there's this product, I, I, I don't even know the exact say how to say that, KUVRD. It's a universal lens cap. It's kind of like this rubber material that you literally put over your lens. So you'll have your lens and you'll put this rubber piece over the lens. And you can also place it on the, the other side of the lens as well. And it not only protects, it's also protected from weather or it makes it water resistant and you can even drop it in some cases and it will still protect the lens over a regular lens cap. Uh, but what's wow. really cool is that the lens cover will cover um, between 60 millimeters to 150 millimeters, which would cover most of your lenses, not all, but most of them, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just laughing. Would you want to get this? Um, you know, the, 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 thing, the thing too is I, I haven't lost lens caps, but I'll show you something that I have actually lost a number of times. And I've just bought a bucket load of these and I forgot to mention it too with new gear, but it's these. Um, oh. I'm constantly losing these things. They drive me nuts. Now, why it's like important that. is because if it rains and you want to protect the camera, it's actually the hot shoe cover mm. that you stick on the camera. I'm losing them all the time. And the problem is if you're dealing with rain, you have to protect those hot shoe, um, the, the mount there, because it will get water on it and it can, and it can fry your camera. So <laughs> that's one thing. But talking about the lens, um, covers or whatever, I, I never use them. I, I buy the lens and I stick them in, in filing immediately, put them away in a cupboard somewhere and never use them again until I sell it. Now, I, I'm really rough. <laughs> if you're watching YouTube, just don't buy my gear, um, obviously. <laughs> but I, I haven't got the time to basically be taking things on and off and stuff. I'm working fast and I find if they're in the bag, they're protected enough anyway. But I'm not sure if you ever saw, there was a, a, a thing I saw on YouTube which was, um, Oh, who's the guy with him and his wife? They always do um, video uh, reviews. Tony, and Charles, Tony Northrup. Northrup. He actually tried to show how hard it was to actually scratch the front element of a lens. And he was using keys and all these other things. And it was incredibly hard to actually scratch them. Try and find that video and have a look at it. But it's really interesting to actually see. Um, so I don't use any of that sort of stuff on because I, if, if it costs me to miss that moment, by trying to fiddle around, by trying to take a lens cap off or whatever or, or store it, I don't use it. So that's the main reason for me not to do that. And I'll always open my case and everyone just goes, oh, you haven't got lens caps on there. But <laughs> you know what? The gear is there to use. And for me, I don't even run filters on them. I run nothing. It's naked, um, which relates back to that condom talk a second ago. But it's all it's <laughs> naked and I just work that way and it's very fast. So, yeah, I'm not interested in putting any lens caps on there, to be honest. The only thing I'll put on there is the actual um, uh, shade, which I will leave on, which stops it from banging it and stuff like that. But I certainly don't use lens caps and stuff like that. Folks, in the comments, let us know if do you use the lens cap or do you go naked with the lenses like David Osler? Do you even put a filter on there? Oh, oh, what are you showing there, Jason? What are you showing there? Oh, no, I'm, just, I'm just like kind of like mimicking what you're saying. Like, oh, do you use a lens cap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to know that. I, I lose my lens caps all the time. So usually I just put the lens in my bag like this. I don't even worry about it. Too much. Usually I'll just put it down this way. So David, you won't even have the back cap then? No, I keep the back cap on. Um, that's the only thing I do keep on. Look, look, my my assistant usually, a second I'll grab it out, takes that cap off. So my assistant will grab the ca uh, the lens out, take the cap off, and then I'll immediately put it on. But sometimes if I am swapping stuff myself, uh, I will uh, change that myself. But that's the only thing I do leave on is the back cap, but I certainly don't leave the front cap. I mean, if you look at any of my cameras now, um, immediately, none of them will have lens caps on. So I'm not running lens caps on 
any of these things. So I just don't use them. And I've never had an issue with any of my lenses being damaged in the fact that the, the front cap gets gets damaged. I mean, I'm not silly with them, but look, I suppose you can be paranoid and keep them on. But like I said, I've never had a scratch put on the lenses and I've never had an issue selling the stuff, but I never, ever run caps on any of the gear. The only time I'd ever put it on is if, for instance, I had them somewhere that they're not in a bag or something like that, and I think I'm, they may get damaged. But 90% of the time I've got them on a bag. If I'm wearing it around my shoulder, I never wear caps on either because you've always got to put that cap somewhere and, you know, lose it. But I just don't use them. Same reason I don't use ND filters either. Everyone always asks me about that, and I never use NDs either. I just crank the shutter speed up. It's another thing that would slow me down, and I, I just can't do it. So it's all about, you know, getting that one image that, matters to me and if it cost me that second it could be the difference of getting the shot or not getting the shot yeah so exactly what david is saying and what 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 this company is selling it, it just from like the product video the demo video it just seems like it's so hard to take off this universal lens cap it looks like you have to like fight it to just to like cap it on and take it off so definitely not something that we want to fi be fiddling around with especially when we're out shooting so i think for event folks who are tackling events it might not be a good idea um, but I think if you just kind of like a one off kind of taking your time, I don't I don't I think it'd be fine for that kind of work. But even one off, it's just like right. you're 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 gonna go through the hassle of taking this darn thing off. So it's not even worth it. Like it's like, oh I want to take a photo, but like, oh I gotta take off my condom. So it's just <laughs> not something you, you wanna be messing around with. So yeah, just not worth it. Like I said, I think lenses are tougher than people give them credit for. Like I said, watch that video of Tony Northrup trying to scratch the lens. It might open everyone's eyes to sort of understand how tough these lenses are. The other thing too is you really have to damage the front element quite bad to, to make it affect the actual photo because the out of focus part of that lens, it won't show. So, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. You put a little blob on the end and see if you can see it in your image, you won't. It, it's really... You really have to damage uh, the front element quite substantially to, to make it affect uh, an actual image. And it's even harder to see if you're using things like 70 to 200s or, you know, lenses that go to 1.4 or 1.8. Um, it's interesting to sort of look at, but they have to be damaged quite badly to, you know, to actually even show up. But they're tougher than what you give them credit for. I mean, I suppose some people might be a, a little bit paranoid and want to protect them as much as they can, which is understandable. But... For me, the shot's more important than protecting the gear. Yeah. What what I will say is um, sometimes there there is dust that gets into the lens, and when I'm shooting like f five point six or f eight, it starts to show. So I would say just have like blow duster in like your 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 backpack just to like give it a quick squeeze when you're especially when you're leaving your caps open. That's that's just for me though. Yeah. I I don't know. I, it yes. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. I, I, it's funny because I've had like three 50 millimeter f 1.8 cannons. Uh, they've they've all fallen and they've all been destroyed. <laughs> they've all been destroyed. <laughs> lenses. So um, and I'm I'm a, I'm a butterfinger um, tendency. I mean, just like that one time I dropped my a six thousand twice in within a span of uh, thirty minutes of each other. I don't know. It just depends. It just depends. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the I think your actual lens cover that the actual that part of your is all you really need though, Danny. I don't think you really need the the cap as long as you've got that on. Uh, you've got more than ample cover. I drop my stuff all the time. I mean, I'm a bit of a klutz as well. Uh, I mean, I've I've broken seventy to two hundred lenses before. Or I've broken cameras before by dropping them, but certainly the lens cap wouldn't have saved anything that I've ever done in, in that respect. But even so, even so, like I said, that the most important thing for me is just to not miss that second yeah. of a moment. If if you've got it around your your shoulder and you have to pull it up and take a cap off, that could be the difference of getting something spontaneously than not getting something spontaneously. And I don't want to ever miss that. That moment so anything that would stop me getting the shot I've eliminated basically all right good stuff <laughs> that was a good discussion um all lens let's caps see. too man. This, is, this is like the most <laughs> the most that we had fire <laughs> just <laughs> use them or don't use them there'll be a few thumb downs on that one <laughs> oh shoot um Hey, Michael, thank you for the $10. I forgot to mention that. Thanks for the $10. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>
Uh, Chris Cheek, caps for sure. Dustin Dilworth, lens caps only for storage between work. Mav fan says he always laughs when people get really upset when someone doesn't use a lens cap in a video. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see Diana says lens cap all the time let's see here you know I always like this funny when you're it's true though when you get a lens cap you don't know where to put it I usually put it in a pocket somewhere and I forget where what pocket it ended up being in and after the shoot's over I'm just scrambling around looking for this lens cap and uh, <laughs> yeah it's always frustrating um yeah or prime lenses all don't kind of like look the same too you're just like is this one it or is this one it is this one it or is this one it it's just like you're it's just like off by like a millimeter too so it's it's, it's frustrating so that's just on I have the label on the label the caps as well let's see I noticed Diana said, um, David Osler, dropping lenses like a boss. I have to tell you, the last time I dropped a camera, it was a 70 to 200 lens. Uh, and I think it was a D4S that I actually had that I dropped. And it cracked on the floor. The most important thing I'll tell everyone is if you ever do that, that was during a wedding and I had the bride looking at me. Uh, you've just got to pretend that it doesn't matter. And that's what I did. I was crying inside. <laughs> But I was basically just not it upset me at all. I said, don't worry about it. I've got plenty of other lenses and plenty of other cameras and the, the lens was broken in half and the uh, lens mount was hanging out out of the camera. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I, just, I would just cry on the spot. I would, I would have put the drama queen right there in front of the bride. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, that still reminds me when I dropped my 24 to 70 Canon. It, felt it bounced. It bounced. Had the lens on. It was fine, but it bounced. <laughs> what the heck? Oh man! I also awesome. did that too, to tell you another story. I also did it with a D4S when it was brand new. I went to England on a trip, and I it fell off my. I had one of the adapters, and it was screwed in on the bottom. I can't remember the strap. I think it's really right stuff or something. I don't know, but it bounced off and it rolled down a hill, and I had to chase it all the way down this hill and it was a brand new d4s rolling down the hill but they were built oh, like it's yeah. fine but <laughs> like what was going through your what was going through your mind when that happened? again that i was with a whole heap of other tourists and i was trying to pretend like it didn't bother me <laughs> shake it off you're just like oh it's fine it's fine there you just you just pull another one out of your bag it's fine just, just let it roll down the hill there it's okay <laughs> Uh, ah, gosh. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and jump on to the next topic here, real quick, and and kind of get David's input on this. Um, if you haven't heard already, there, I think it's gonna happen. I think it's a for sure. There's gonna be a Panasonic GH5S around the corner. Uh, some of the video specs that have been kind of put out there already through um, Micro Four Thirds rumors, uh, or is it mirrorless? Is it Micro Four Thirds rumors? I think uh, Cinema 4K 60P 422 10 bit long gop. Don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, 240 frames per second full HD. Uh, $2,500 price tag is what it's looking like it's going to be. And um, yeah, $2,499. And I wanted to go ahead and pick David's brain a little bit. Um, what's it like been for you? Uh, it's you've you've had the J Tribe for some time now. What's it like been using both Panasonic and Sony together with your work? Yeah, really good actually. I've been surprised. Uh, it's actually here. Um, I've been surprised how well the actual camera works with the the Sony gear. I'm tending to use. I will only. I'm only using the the GH5 really though for static shots. Well, I know I'm using for both things, but there's a, there's a couple of things I'll always record now the ceremony with the GH5 because I can just leave it running. Um, and if I need things like say using 4K 60P where I've got the bride just walking and I want to slow it down, things like that, uh, it's really the only option out there for running 4K 60P. So it's it's fantastic for that. The other thing too is. It's an, the stabilization is out of this world on that camera. There's a new feature that just came out in the latest update that basically you can hand hold it and it's like it's on a tripod. It's that good that you can actually hand hold it looking like it's on a tripod. So it, it's sort of changed the, the way I shoot a lot of the time where I don't have to use monopods and stuff like that anywhere near the amount that I did 
uh, before. The areas where it really suffers though is the autofocus just sucks. There's, there's no way you can use that camera on autofocus. You have to do manual focusing, which doesn't bother me, but you, you can't run autofocus on that. And the low light is nowhere near as good as what you get from Sony where I can run the GH5 up to about 1600 ISO anything over that, it starts to degrade very quickly. But to be honest, I very rarely ever go past 1600 ISO anyway because I add light and that, that's now what I'm starting to do in receptions and stuff. So the low light aspect of it doesn't worry me that much. But the things I'm, I'm using is, uh, if I'm doing run and gun stuff in the wedding, like on a gimbal, I'm using all my Sony gear. Uh, if I'm using a lot of shots where the bride will be walking down the aisle, I'm using my A9 or, or an A6500 where I've got that autofocus. So they're things where they'll work so well together. And I've worked out now that the profiles, I can mix them fairly comfortably now that uh, so they, they, they balance fairly closely together. So I don't think that's really an issue uh, anymore. It just comes down to the fact there's no perfect camera and, and that's what I always say to people is there's no perfect Sony, there's no perfect GH5. But I can see the fact that I think this new GH5S is going to probably drop down the megapixels to around about 11 or 12 megapixels. That's probably the only way that they can improve the low light uh, of that camera, but it's still not going to get anywhere near what an A7S II will be. I, I think it will probably get up to the standard of, say, an A6500, which I can easily push to 6400 uh, ISO shooting video. So I think that's probably what they're going to aim at with that is, say, improving the ISO to about 6400. I don't think it'll go much above that because of, of the Micro Four Thermat. I, micro four thirds, I just don't think they'll push it much more than what that is and whether they can improve the autofocus but unless they get the same type of system using PDAF like what Sony have, I don't think the autofocus is going to improve that much. The G9 still hasn't improved much in video. It's definitely fantastic for stills though. The GH5 for stills is amazing and I can't explain to people how good it is in autofocus for stills and I'm not quite certain why they can't transfer that over to the video side, there must be a reason whether it's that hunting of focus going between both. But um, I found overall, honestly, that I'm really happy with how it performs. I still probably would get an A6-7000 if that's released or an A7S3 when that's released, but I'll still probably keep the, A, the GH5 for the no record limit alone. Remember, the new cameras that we're getting now from Sony aren't giving us that ability to, to shoot with no record limit. And because I'm shooting Fusion, walking away from that camera that's on a tripod, I don't have to worry if that's gonna go for an hour and a half. If the ceremony takes an hour, I can just leave it recording and it will just keep going. And that for me is a big feature. That's one reason why I won't sell my A7R2 because I, I want to keep that feature in case if I do need it. That no record limit is, is a big thing for me. But I am gonna wait and see what the GH5S has to offer and also wait and obviously and see what Sony release. I do think that if this is released on January the 8th, I think they're talking about, um, that Sony may push the A7S2 forward in their announcement to compete because I don't think they're going to want to let Panasonic get too much of a foothold in that market. So it, it could be a really interesting thing to see what happens. So would I convert over to, to Panasonic? No. All my still work is still going to be Sony. I still love Sony. I still love Sony for the autofocus. When I'm doing my videos on YouTube, I can walk towards the camera and it'll be in focus. I can't do that with the GH5. You've only got to watch Casey Nasset stuff and you can see that that camera is... <laughs> <laughs> That's because he's using the GH5. Uh, it's not yeah. going to be solved, so you definitely can't move over to a GH5 personally. Sony is still my first love, but the GH5 has given me something extra that Sony just aren't giving me at the moment. 4K 60p, once you start shooting with that, is incredible. It, it's stunning. And, you know, I just love that aspect of it. I'm so hoping Sony bring that out in the next camera. I would love it if they brought out an A6-7000 that gave me four minutes of 4K 60p footage. That's all I'd need. And Sony, I keep saying to you, give us that, guys, because most people would be happy with four minutes. Uh, you know, it's all I'd need for 4K 60p. Give it to us. You know what's interesting is that I've seen, uh, you know, with Casey when you mentioned Casey Nice that the um, the Micro Four Thirds rumors does mention that Casey Nice has potentially using a GH five S, and the autofocus isn't working very very well at all, um, especially yeah. when he's using it, and it's kind of a shame. Um, I think the, you know, 
like I said, I, I manually focus still when I need to, but I also like the ability to have continuous autofocus with my Sony cameras as well. Really great having that. Um, but I definitely hope that is something I, I'm hoping it's not that he's not using GH5S and they can resolve the autofocusing issue and give those users that. I know a lot of folks are probably not wanting to have to upgrade to a GH5S. Um, but we'll see what it does. David, real quick though, on the GH5, do you think David? I've tried everything with the GH5 for focus. I've tried every possible combination that you can try. The focus is just, the autofocus is just, it just sucks. It, if you can't compare that to Sony. The second I'm using a gimbal, I'll be using my A6300 or the A6 or the A6500. Uh, they will always be gimbal cameras for me. Even the A7R2 is amazing autofocus. It, it's incredible. The A9 though is in another league. Um, but you, you know, it's, yeah. What were you gonna say, Danny, so? Yeah. Was it, or are you is the GH5 up to 180 frames per second? Uh, yes, it'll do that in 4K 180. You can go up to 200 1080p, right? 1080p, right? 1080p, yeah. And the good thing is, it's it's not soft like the A6500, and that is too. That can be really soft if you start to push up. Um, so their slow motion is really good. I still think if you're dealing with just a video camera alone, the GH5 is a far superior camera than anything that Sony have to offer in their uh, in their sort of like the A7R2 or, or whatever. The video features are, are incredible. You know, you're 400 megabits. It's all AI, which is incredibly easy to to manipulate in 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 uh, Final Cut. It's a great Kodak. Uh, the, the results are really good in it, but it's just not a good focusing camera. So you've got to understand that side of it. Um, Log works great on the GH5, but I still, if I had to choose, I'd still get the the Sony cameras just because of that autofocus. So I don't want to be autofocusing all the time, uh, manual focusing all the time. But, you know, I think the next Sony A7R 3 will probably match what the GH5 has now. But that's going to be a lot more expensive than what the GH5 is. You, you know, you're sort of talking about, I'm not sure how much the uh, A7S III, it's probably going to be up around the A9 area. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in, in that field. But for video solely, the GH5 is fantastic. If you're dealing with Fusion, okay. the Sony is much better than what um, the GH5 is. Um, so I think overall, Sony is a better overall camera but the GH5 is a better video camera than what Sony has. David, what's your go-to your go-to lenses if you're shooting video with the with the Panasonic GH5 of GH5, and then if you're shooting photos, what are your go-to lenses on that system? Yeah, well, I'm using on the GH5 most of the time. I'm using the 24. Well, it's the 12 to 35. That that's the 2.8 lens. So that is equivalent to 2470. But I also love the primes. Like I, I've put a recent video on because I wanted to test to see how this went even in stills. And I put the 42.5, I think it is. It's the Panasonic lens on there that is stunning. And have a look at that video because you'd be surprised how good this is for stills. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't take good photos with a, a GH5. You can. It's still not as good as a Sony, but it's still amazingly good. So I love that 42 0.5, that's the equivalent to the 85 millimeter one. And I've also got a Voigtlander, which I love, which is the 10, I think it's the 10 millimeter and it's the 0 0.95, which gives me, you know, really low light ability to shoot in, in great low light. But but I found there's, there's certain things that Sony I'm hoping can match. The stabilization is one thing that the GH5 is incredible. Like I said, it's like you, you've got it mounted on a tripod. It's that steady. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, but my favorite is still Sony. I have to still say that the, my favorite camera is the A9. By far, it's the best camera I've ever had in my life. But I am utilizing now the GH5. But I'm, like I said, I'm waiting to see what Sony release in the next version of cameras to think about whether I'll upgrade. But I'll, I'll probably still keep the GH5 for that no time limit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it, it's it's I'm a lot happier than what I thought I would be. But you have to manually focus. That that's the thing with it. Okay. All right, well, there you go, GH5, GH5S. I guess we'll find out very soon enough in uh, in early January when that happens. Um, they might announce the CES, so I'll be there to take a look at it. Yeah, Jason Bond will be there. He'll let us know what happens with the Panasonic GH5S. <laughs> Trash. <laughs> um, all right, folks, we're going to jump to one more topic for this evening to go ahead and round it out.
Um, and it's going to be actually talking about a computer, the iMac Pro. And we'll see how that goes. So, and after that, we're going to go ahead and take some Q&A questions from the audience uh, after we finish up that last topic for this evening. So if you have any questions, go ahead and start loading them up for us, and we'll tackle it this evening as well with a hashtag QA or a question mark at the end there. Um, before we dive into the topic, was there anything you guys caught in the chat by any chance? Mm. <laughs> if not, we can go ahead and jump through. Let's see. Not too much. Not too much. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump into the news topic. Okay, so if you haven't heard already, uh, the iMac Pro was announced, what, like six months ago? I think it was a while back. Uh, well, anyhow, so, um, Apple is now releasing a iMac, but in a Pro model, to sort of appease those who have not had an update from their Mac Pro, aka their trash can, for some time now. Um, and this iMac Pro is having a, a, a variety of flavors. It has it goes from eight cores all the way to eighteen core Xeons, uh, up to one hundred and twenty eight gigabytes of RAM from thirty two to one hundred twenty eight. You also get SSD, very fast SSD storage from one terabyte to four terabytes, and you also have a Radeon Vega fifty six or sixty four flavor with eight or sixteen gigabytes of VRAM. I think that's the way to go about it. Um, and starting base price for their initial model starts roughly uh, at $4,999. And oh. it goes all the way up to $13,000. And that's going to be Jason Vong's next purchase, 18-core maxed out iMac Pro. So I guess the question I want to field for uh, for our viewers as well as our guests this evening, well, Jason Vong and David, you know, who are you, who do you think this is for? Uh, would you see yourself upgrading to this? And um, yeah, is this because I'm hearing a lot of backlash over this because of pricing? But I think the reason why people are upset, said because I don't think it's really the computer for them. It's it's more like a workstation computer. That's the way I see it, and they can definitely charge the premium prices. So, David, Jason, what are you guys' thoughts on this particular computer? Let's start with Jason in this case. Jason, what are your thoughts on this? Man, it's funny because I was just talking to my cousin about this and about getting like the 18 core, but I think 18 core is like overkill for what we do, at least for with YouTube videos. So if anything, I think uh, Max Zero put out like a really good video talking about the best price, price to what price to specs to performance ratio was like a, like a, like a 10 core or something like that. So I probably settled for like a 10 core, but geez, I can't fathom dropping five to ten grand on a, on a computer you know and and there's there's gonna be a lot of people gonna be talking about how like it's gonna be so hard to upgrade the iMac Pro because it's just everything is built in that one very thin display so to buy something that I can only use for I don't know three to five years it's it's, it's pretty insane I think David will probably have something different to say since he's using he's still rocking the the Mac Pro trash can for all this <laughs> for all the time. <laughs> Have, you, have yeah. you found the need to upgrade any sort of small little internal parts on your Mac Pro, David? No, I, I actually haven't. I, I bought the top-ended one when I bought it, so it was pretty expensive, actually. I can't remember how much it was, but I, can't I imagine. did buy the top-ended one with the, double, uh, with the dual cards that, that's still in there. And to be honest, I'm still happy with that performance that that's giving me. Um, do, would I buy an iMac though? I don't think I would. There's no way I'd pay that much money to have a, a monitor and everything built in that you can't upgrade at all. You can't even upgrade the RAM on those those computers. So it, it's not future-proof, and that's probably what would worry me about that. At least with the Mac Pro that I bought, you can add RAM if you wanted to add RAM, and later on they've been able to change motherboards and do other things. But um, I'd be worried that in the fact that if the monitor fails, you're going to lose your whole machine. So that part to me... For workstation is is not a, a good move. I think that would be really bad. And to be honest, the prices that they're looking at this computer, you're looking into workstation territory. So it, I can't really think why you'd justify having a machine that, that is a workstation that's an all-in-one. Not only that, if you're dealing with it, and I was mentioning this before in the pre-show, that the noise from the iMac alone, when you start to stress those computers, they get really loud. And that's why I love this computer so much because it's right next to me, a foot away from me. Even if that thing is doing Final Cut working 4K footage, you can't hear it. And for things like what I'm doing and, and 
for workstation things that could be also similar, you wouldn't want a stack of these adding heat to rooms. You'd have to increase the air conditioning, everything else, because they blow out an awful lot of heat. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea to be running workstations in an all-in-one. To be honest, if you were paying that sort of money for an iMac, I'd be waiting to see what they release in the new Mac Pro because at least that's going to be modular where you can add a, another monitor to that. And if something goes wrong, you don't have to lose the whole system. If your monitor goes down, you don't have to move, lose the whole computer and not be able to work for a while. The other thing that they've lost, quick, David, I think, but that was a funny thing though, was that I don't know, I'm hoping when they said modular, they meant that you could actually swap parts out. But I was wondering if they meant modular that you would have to use specified components uh, to actually go ahead and swap into the Mac Pro or their upcoming Mac Pro. But um, you're definitely on point with the regards to just waiting. If you are looking for a workstation computer, you can wait for it. I think looking to see what the Mac yeah. Pro might have would be the best option to go, considering the amount of money you're having to drop on this particular unit already. Um, it's too much money. It's way too much money for an all-in-one workstation. I mean, honestly, if I was paying that sort of money for that thing, I'd prefer to, to buy something else and go on a holiday. It's it's just too much money for what you're actually paying in, in an all-in-one unit. Remember, they're, they're more throwaway items, unfortunately, you know, that because there's far more heat is a killer in these things. And if you're dealing with things that are going to run that hot, you know, you don't know how that's going to be in another 12 months. And having it with your monitor all inclusive of the whole thing is... I think asking for trouble. If you're doing this for a business particularly, I would be not running an all-in-one type unit because it's too dangerous if, if that's what you're, you know, you're dealing with. And if you can't upgrade the RAM even in that, you know, having paying that sort of money, I bought OWC RAM for this because it was too expensive to buy uh, the Mac RAM. It was way overpriced. So I bought OWC, which is a company in, in the US that I buy all of the stuff from. So I'm sure OWC will probably release something that you can add uh, into that new Mac Pro, and at least you can upgrade it, which will make it last longer if you need to do that. But having it where you can't upgrade anything, you don't know what's going to be released in two years' time. You know, that machine might not be fast enough anymore. So it, do, it's, think, it's a lot to ask. I think, the, um, I, I think Mac rumors pointed out that, that they, they are, you are able to potentially upgrade the RAM, but it's not going to be user upgradable, it seems. Uh, it's going to have to be done either through potentially yes, you've got to send it in. party service. Yes. Yeah. It's not yeah. So, I don't know, man. If you are, I mean, I've had RAM. Yeah. I've had RAM die on that computer, and I've actually replaced it myself. I, I just ordered the RAM basically and, and put the new uh, boards in. That now, if if that was the new iMac, it'd obviously have to go back to Apple or wherever, and you're going to lose that timeline or waiting how long it, it would be. Uh, I just don't. I think it's too much money. And just be careful with reviews on it. Make sure that they're not reviewing the high ended model with what they're showing on YouTube. And you think you're getting that performance on the lower end of models. So just be careful. Um, but I just think how long is this going to last in this unit where it's all held together in such a tight, you know, structure? Is it going to have issues in a couple of years' time where, because heat is the killer of these devices, and I, I just don't know. There you go. Let's see. Thirteen grand, though it's a lot of money. Yes, um, but I think the folks who are after this probably know exactly what they want. It, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to go ahead and pick up a machine like this just for doing YouTube videos and and the kind of work that I'm doing right now. I'd rather just. But again, I'm a different. I'm an. I'm in a different market. I'm a different audience for this. I would probably just go ahead and build something if it was if it was in my situation, but. I mean, if people want this and they want it, I, I don't blame them. I go for it if you got the money to get it. Um, but yeah, not for me. Jason Vong, you'll you'll get yours in right in January. Is that, is that yeah, it's <laughs> for it. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Improve David Vong. It's gonna be a fantastic machine for the next five years. <laughs> it is sexy. Right. I'll give it that. But like like I probably wait for the Mac Pro. Yeah, we'll do. All right, I think that's going to do it for us on the news topic portions there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Jason kind of helped uh, procure some questions. I think that's the right term. Uh, <laughs> some questions for us uh, in the document. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. And uh, are you okay? Asked us earlier. He asked if uh, our, uh, have we ever considered making a current lens slash camera collection 
video. Um, I have. I've been waiting to collect some more things, and then I'll go ahead and make the video. Um, <laughs> Jason, what about you? Uh, I already. I have one that kind of details my YouTube setup. Um, but other than that, I think maybe this or next week I'll have one where I'll talk about some of the best investments that I've gotten over the year, like the year that actually have served me really well, and that it was that was worth every penny. So I might have one coming out either this or next week. So, yeah. All right, David Osler. Um... How about yourself? I've only got, sh I've just got shoots that I've done that I'll be posting over the next couple of weeks. So that's probably what I'm concentrating on. I tend to show more shoots than anything else. Um, so I'm probably just going to be showing that over the coming uh, weeks. That's my passion. So, you know, I'll probably have a that's few good. of those. I tend to not be so much on the hardware. I tend to be more on the actual shooting, I suppose. He doesn't want to show us all the good stuff he has, Jason. <laughs> Everything's <laughs> hidden. <laughs> yeah, I shot this. Does he does he have does he have that missing Hasselblad from the camera store? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> shot it with this amazing camera, but you don't know what it is. That sucks. That the that camera store got that broken. In. Oh man. Um, let's see here, Jason. You threw a question in there from Productions Doe. It's asking, do you guys think that it's technically possible? With the current technology to have a crop ratio close to APS-C with 4K 660 or full frame? Do you remember what that was coming from, Jason? Uh, it was some, some time ago with the GH5 question, probably. I think it was right after we completed the GH5, so... I guess he's... I'm going to skip that question. I guess he's just asking, like, if it's possible to have 4K60 anytime soon on a crop camera or a full frame camera. They're saying it's easy. I guess he's referring that it's easier to have it on a phone slash a micro four thirds camera, right? No idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no idea. Please clarify what you're asking, and Danny will take care of that question for you. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm what sure the heck? The, the only thing I think the only thing stopping Sony releasing it, and I think that's why the A7S III has been taking so long to come out is because of the heat. Um, yeah. They're going to have to solve mm -hmm. that heat problem. So I think as the second that that's solved, they'll release something that can do the 4K 60p. I mean, the only reason probably why they can do it even on this camera is because that body is so big. I mean, it, it's a big body that they've got in there. So the heat sinks in it are probably quite substantial. So yeah. Sony have to get around that side of it. You know, that, that's the problem with, and that's why I mentioned the iMac. If you're dealing with small enclosed spaces, there's issues with heat, and that's probably what Sony are going to have to fight or, or solve before they can release the new A7S III, perhaps. I'm hoping that's the case. I mean, once they send something to me, I mean, I could test it out for them. But, hey, you know, I mean, I'd be willing to test the overheating scenario on the A7S III, but uh, I'm never going to get <laughs> on my way. <laughs> um. I think Ariel Branc uh, Bronco asked, uh, the 30-minute record time limit on the A7R3, is it hackable? Pro maybe? I, I don't know. The, the, the Sony Play, the Play Memories app was the, the last string sort of to be able to get that little hack going uh, to get the Play Memories tweak in order to get the time limit removed. So I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible. Who knows? Let's see here. I do wonder, I do wonder though why they got rid of that app. I mean, why did they get rid of that? Is it just to stop us doing that hack? I think so. I mean, the reason why they took that out. I, I'm I'm calling it here. I think that was the, the actual reason. It sucks. It's kind of buggy. I mean, it was slow, but I personally never really used it. But I think that might have might have been a really good reason. There are apps that I use, like I use that hack all the time. I also love how you can stop it starting up to show PAL or NTSC. It gets rid of that bug as well if you're using the, the Sony cameras when you're starting up. Sometimes I do like to shoot in the US format and, you know, that's that's a problem because it always shows that thing coming up saying it's in the wrong format. The other thing too, I use Smooth Reflections all the time and I love that app. That's such a good app. Uh, even where you can control 
I can't remember the name of the other app where you can control, uh, like it's an ND filter for the sky and stuff like yeah. that. You can do multiple exposures like that, which works really quite good. And, and the inbuilt um, time, uh, ex what is it, the inbuilt, um, what is it where you do your time shots over multiple period of time? What's that called? Um, time lapse. The inbuilt time lapse apps that you've got built into those apps as well is gone. So it means now you've got to lug around another bit of hardware, an intervalometer to actually get a, you know, time lapse. And they're little things that still matter to me. And I, I just wish, for the sake of getting rid of that 4K time limit, I mean, I know they have to pay for that. That's one thing Panasonic actually pay for. But Sony yeah. shouldn't have been responsible if someone hacks that, you know. I, I, one of these days, those 6300s are going to be very, very valuable with the uh, time hack and even the Alpha 6500s. That's a, that's a solid point. That's that's going to be some really amazing stuff one day. Um, Harold asked, oh, well, he asked earlier, Harold asked, what's your go-to video lens? Uh, well, your go-to lens for the 6300, 6500 for video. What would you be your go-to video lens? Um, 24, 1.8. Boom. Same. I think that's, that's it. That's it. Or 16 to 70 actually, but 24, 1.8 is a pretty good one. Those will be the two go to lenses for me. There you go. Uh, I'm not quite a, quite a good lens too that I use. I don't mind the 18 to 105 as a travel lens. Um, that's quite good too. Uh, if you want to sort of travel lightly and just take the one lens, that that's that's also very good. But I, I think that thirty-five is such a good focal length. That's why I love the twenty. You know, twenty-eight one point five. I love that twenty-four one point five. I should say, uh, one point eight. I always get confused with numbers. Um, that's one of my favorite lenses. That's what I'm using now. All right, uh, JPH Creatives asking any rumors on what Sigma E Contemporary Tele Length number will be or what the next sigma telelength will be um i don't know they just short telephoto prime so my guess is are they talking apsc here i think i think he's talking about apsc so somewhere along the line of the um the 16 and the 30 and the 30s so he's asking the next iteration for that so we've got a 16 we've got a 30 Right, a 16 millimeter, a 35 millimeter, 50, a uh, fast prime. They said short, 50. I can't, ima I can't imagine I it know. to be beyond 50 to like 60. Five. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's a tele length. 85, 85 in terms of being a full frame equivalent, but probably like a what, 50 or 60. Yeah. yeah. A 55, a Sigma 55. To go against the the, the, the Sony's eyes. <laughs> All right, Justin Godson's asking. I'm going to Japan next week. I have a 28 f2, a 55 1.8, and I'm debating bringing the 7200 f4 or the 85 1.8. Do you think I need the 7200, or will the 85 be enough for travel? Thanks. So the question is, the 85 or the 7200? for travel, which one would you go with? Well, I, I, you know what, if you can carry it, I'd take the 70 to 200. One of the big differences too with landscapes, and I don't think enough people do it, is to shoot at 200 millimeter. Um, because sometimes if you shoot everything wide, you don't get an idea of scale. And that's half of the problems with some landscape shots where you, where you just don't get that idea of how large something is. If you can say, zoom in, it gives you a total different look than if you're shooting, say, 16 millimeter or whatever, shooting wide. So whenever I'm shooting landscape, I try and also shoot that long sort of 200 millimeter look to it because it will bring that mountain in against a tree or something like that using compression. Um, and it's something that can make your landscape images look different than what a lot of other people are doing that are just tending to shoot wide. So one thing I always like to do is I'll take a long lens like that, like a 7200 and a wide lens and, and just use those two in combination. Uh, and I find that that's good. Um, you probably don't need anything like in between that, like an 85 or whatever. I, I probably wouldn't take that. I'd take just the 70 to 200 and the and your wide angle lens. 
uh, could possibly be enough. You just need also something if you're going to do night photography. You know, you've got to have something wide enough and fast enough that you could do stars and uh, and stuff like that as well. So you've got to consider that that wide angle lens has to be, um, you know, around 1.8 or whatever, uh, fast enough to to get you that um, astro photography if you wanted to do that too. But that's that's just what I think. I'd take the 7200 f4. Yeah. So what I would what I would say is that when I went to Japan last year, I brought the 85 and I wished I brought the 7200 G master. So to give to, 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 to just agree with David on that, bring the 7200. I think you would enjoy that more. Would you consider that bringing the 135? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would like not learn my lesson and still bring a prime lens the next time. But I, but just from basing off my last experience, I think having a 7200 is super handy. That's why I found with the A6300 and the A6500 that that 10 to the 18 to 105 is such a good lens because it gives you that sort of equivalent of 200 mil, you know, around that sort of thing. You're getting reasonable wide and you're getting that long focal length as well. That, that's why that lens is such a great travel lens. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, as a travel lens, that lens, because like I said, you need that compression. You, you don't want to just be shooting everything wide because it looks boring in the end. And if you're trying to shoot mountains, they'll look small if you use a really wide angle lens that you won't get that perspective of them looking really big and, and the compression there that you need. Mountains will always look better if you're shooting at a long focal length. All right. Well, we've got some interesting, another question coming around here. Uh, JPH Creatives asking any signs of Zoom updating the Crane 2 to have follow focus work with Sony? Um, they haven't told me anything personally, but they haven't told me anything personally. I, I have seen like con either a concept art or some sort of image that, that that does detail like this external follow focus that mounts on top of the gimbal to control the focus on the camera. So. As far as the information goes, that's all I have, and I'm not sure if that's even if that's even real or not. But from but it was posted from their official page. So other than that, I have no like release dates for whatever the follow focus is. But so Jason Vaughn will let us know when it happens. So make yeah, sure I'll let you know when I get it too, because I'm pretty <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'll have them send me one just to just to play with. But the autofocus right. on the Sony is so good already. I can't imagine why you would want to follow focus on on top of the Sony and the Crane 2. Jason, you've got both of those gimbals, haven't you, the V2 and the uh, version 2 of those. Yeah. How do you find, because I'm shooting Fusion, like I said, that's where I'm using that Fossi tech or whatever, I can't remember the name of it, but I'm trying to go as light as possible with the A6500 on, on the gimbal. Um, in my situation, w would I be better to just have the first version, the version 2, uh, against the new ver Do you find that too heavy to sort of hold? I do wedding scenario like, if i was to be completely honest with you i prefer i still prefer the crane one version two just because it's so much lighter and i'm sure you're rocking like a, a light prime with your 6500 on that gimbal too right david yeah, yeah that i mean well actually i'm often running the 10 to 18. yeah so even then you know that's that's better that way if you have a crane two for that setup it's a completely overkill it's more designed for people who want to put like a sigma 18 to 35 or a 24 to 70 on the crane so that's where the crane two comes into play for everything else that's smaller and lighter stick with the v2 yep okay awesome done uh and guys by the way we are going to be wrapping up soon uh as far as our questions going so another one we got from austin dunn is the 24 105 is the 24105 f2.8 a lens we could see in the future to follow off the f4, or would it be too large and too heavy? I think that'd be a really big lens. That'd be a big <laughs> lens, and I don't, I don't really, I don't think it's very common to see a 24105 2.8, right? So it's always usually f4 from like other camera brands. Too heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I, th so, I think if I was buying a new lens now, I wouldn't buy the seventy to two hundred, uh, the twenty four seventy anymore. I'd, I'd buy that. Uh, what is it? The twelve to what was it? What was that focal length? The twelve um, to twenty four or 12, the the sixteen. And what's the, the? Well, I wouldn't buy the seventy uh, twenty four seventy. I'd get that. What was the new one that Sony just announced recently? The twenty four one hundred five. Yes, I'd buy that. I think I'd be buying that now over the the 
you know, 24 70. But that's just me personally. I'd like to have that extra reach. So, and I've heard nothing but good reports about how sharp that lens is. Like Jason even said before, it was very sharp. Yes. Okay, let's see here. We'll take a couple more questions and let's see in the chat there. I pasted, I pasted a few. Oh, it's on, it's on, I a, think it's I on a, it's on the next page. Oh, shoot. I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, JPH Creative uh, Rico's for NDs? Rec recommendations. Yes. He's asking for recommendations. Oh, recommendations for NDs. My newer variable is Major Poo, but it was dirt cheap, so no surprise. Um, I haven't been using neutral densities for video, but... Um, I, I think David said he doesn't use any. So for me, I, I've always um, I, I've got, I used it. Back when I used it, I had a Tiffin variable ND filter. So that's the one that I would recommend. Yeah, I, I, I've got Tiffin. I've got a number of Tiffin. I bought the whole range for every lens I've got. And like I said, I just don't use them. Um, I just crank the shutter speed. You know what, for the type of shooting I do, it just doesn't make the, the slightest bit of difference. No one has ever said to me, it looks a bit jerky. Um, I, I only I ever got that in YouTube help, comments, help. but never the clients. Yeah, that's right. They, it'll only be the pixel peepers. There's there's no client will ever notice that you're cranking the shutter. I'll, I'll crank the shutter up to whatever I need to put it up to. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you just don't notice it. All right, question from Michael Mistro. The Movi or the Ronin, Servo or Manual, Zoom or Primes? Some three questions in there. Uh, I haven't used the Moby or the Ronin. Have you guys used either? No. Uh, I've used the Ronin, but honestly, I'm I'm like seeing Crane now. Pist pistol handed gimbals are so much better. <laughs> uh, servo or manual? I, so is he talking about focus? I think he's talking about <laughs> that's 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 from Canon. I, I like manually zooming, like zooming manually zooming the lens. That's what I prefer. Okay, um, got it. Me too. And yeah, then, sign. and then zooms or primes. Which one would you go with? If I had to choose, I would go with primes. primes. If I was stuck. Yeah, definitely primes. Yep, definitely primes. Okay, um, A1 Once Productions. You start as, I to go back. I'll go for it. Okay. A1 Productions. Hey, David, Jason, and Danny, I just recently ordered the A7R3. I was wondering if you think for a telephoto, if I should get the 7200G Master or a 100 to 400, 4.5 to 5.6 for indoor basketball and football. Oh, you, man. <laughs> um, I, I shot basketball. I shot indoor basketball. Our, our gym finally got some newer lights, so I was able to shoot at 6400 ISO and still get a shutter speed of one five hundredth of a second, and I was very happy with the results. Um, it just you just you just got to know how bright the gyms that you're shooting within are doing. Um, it the 100 400 is a little bit tight with the with the a7r3 you know and in indoor indoor basketball for me when i was shooting with it but you'll absolutely take advantage of it for football if you're shooting outdoors so i that's a tough one oh, that's true okay yeah the 7200 is the most versatile one and i would probably tack a 1.4x teleconverter if you wanted to have the flexibility of an f2.8 that's just how I look at it. I, just so that you can work in lower light conditions, the 7200 would give you more flexibility in the end. That's my take on it. Cool. Um, Grant Maddox, will the 90D have 4K or higher frame rates? I'm going to say no. <laughs> so I'm going to say no on that one. The <laughs> Canon 90D. We have reasonable. I still doubt don't think it's have 4K. Maybe the 7D Mark III is what's touted to have 4K, but I don't think the 90D is going to have it. Mm -hmm. Andrew Andrews asks about the education discount on A7R3. I have not yet. I have not yet. 
Okay. Is, is that going to do it for us this evening, guys? I think I, that's it. I think so. It's already been uh, it's just about it's beer, past... about beer o'clock for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that's going to do it kept, for us I've for this morning. For, you guys. <laughs> for our Monday live show, again, we want to thank our guest host this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are. David Osler, thanks again for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Uh, absolutely love hearing your perspective. I, and, and I think in a future show, I do want to pick your brain more about how you tackle the hybrid, uh, the fusion shooting, having to tackle both photos and video, and kind of picking your brain a little more about that in a future show. How do you deal with that, especially jumping with Panasonic and Sony? Um, but at this time, David, well, how can people find you? on the internet and the interwebs. Jason, is there any way we can get a link for uh, for David Osler there so that people can check him out? Yeah, let me, let me pull yeah, most. I mean, obviously, you can follow me on YouTube uh, if you follow me on there, but I also have a fairly big following on Instagram as well, and that's just D David Osler, I think, on, on Instagram. I have quite a big following there. Um, but, yeah, just basically, I mean, similar things to like you guys. I love you guys, so I'm, I'm actually so happy that you have me on. I love popping in, having a chat to you both. Um, so thanks for, you know, giving me the opportunity. For sure. Um, and just down there anyway. Yep. So that's my YouTube. I think for Instagram, you definitely have to search Dostler, D-O-A-S-T-L-E-R. Um, Cause I found, I found, I found an Instagram of a mortgage business, David Osler, but I was like, that's <laughs> not, he I, think it might, I think it might be D Osler. Let me just check. Yeah, I Dude, you have to do D Osler in order to find, uh, to find it. yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's D Osler and it's also Twitter is D Osler as well. So it's, they're all the same, um, things but if you've looked at me on on youtube at the bottom of every video i'll put all my social media links facebook and youtube and also my whole uh, portfolio so it's one way that you can sort of follow me that way as well but yeah there you go that's going to do it for us jason is there anything last things you want to mention before we head out this evening um no i guess that's it that's it for me all right um and may the force be with you for those of you that got to see Star Wars already. <laughs> That'll do it for us. Thanks so much, guys. And good night. See you later, guys. Bye. Peace. Peace. Bye. Okay.